You are listening to Revenue Insights. Today, I'm joined by Frederic Guiton, Chief Revenue Officer at Quality Labor Management. In his career, Frederic has worked at startup, financial, and investment firms. So, Frederic, pleasure to chat today. Hey, how are you? Yeah, fantastic. How are you? Good. Good. Well, let's let let's dive into it. Um, I had to do a bit of reading up um, on QLM being across the pond, but I'd love to hear it in your words, Frederick, of um, your story, how you've got to where you are today, and a bit more about QLM. Sure. Yeah, so um, I moved to the US in 1996. Actually, went to school in England, so I was on your side of the <laughs> world. Uh, I went to Nottingham Trent University. Yeah, yeah. Um I met a good-looking American girl from school, so everything I had moved here. Uh, so that's kind of the short of it. Uh, worked at different roles, but became an executive. Um, roughly like 13, 14 years ago um, at different spaces. I worked in banking, uh, buying distressed at a software startup, um, and, and now in, in the staffing industry. Um, what's been interesting, the common thread, it's always been around, you know, strategy ultimately right strategy revenue growth uh, which always you know revenue is all these things coming together with this outcome that's revenue uh, so so that's kind of been my my path i've been at qlm now for two, a little over two years um knew the owner from for many years we we met through nonprofit work uh, and i was super excited about what the company stands for, frankly. That was my exciting part about why I joined QLM, about helping people secure um, you know, revenue for their family, securing income, uh, and doing jobs that they're best qualified for, as well as helping them maximize their ability to grow professionally. Meanwhile, also helping our customers find the right people to fulfill their promises to their clients. So there's a really neat kind of connection of on my background, I come from a small town of, of you know, a lot of blue collar and, and, and farming industry. So it's kind of a, I don't know, there's things coming together. Yeah, I, uh, I, can, uh, I can relate to that coming from, uh, for, from farming communities, but um, maybe we'll save that for the after hours conversation. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm curious, um, certainly given, I guess, uh, on a more meta note, like the the state of the world at the minute, and in in your part of it, from a staffing and recruiting perspective, what's kind of the state of the the, the in- industry in that space at the minute? Um, is it and particularly around your your mission around finding people the right roles? Obviously, certainly on on my side of the pond, it's uh, it's in a very interesting time from a from a job market perspective, whereby. Um, there's a lot less jobs out there. It's far more competitive. I'm, I'm just very curious to hear kind of your perspective on it currently. Yeah, so, I mean, right now what we're seeing is uh, we have a um, labor market that is in the U.S. very healthy, frankly, um, meaning you know, a lot of people are working. So finding talented people is, is actually difficult. Um, our primary focus is in the construction space. Um, so we do like some construction, we do some maritime work, like unloading ships as well. Um, industrial work of like, you know, um, working like instead of like factories and things like that. Um, I would say that the labor market, uh, is, is, um, you know, getting in some ways, it's getting a little bit easier to recruit slightly. Uh, but the unemployment in the U S is so low that, you know, we're really short talent I mean, that would be the gist of it, which makes the price go up, you know, basic laws of offer and demand. Uh, so, you know, educating our clients, getting good information is super important for them to be able to know this. And if you want to get a great electrician, it might be 25 bucks an hour, even though your flight was 22. And if you got 22, you won't get the kind of talent, ultimately it's going to cost you more. So how do we, you know, tactically present that information to really help them, you know, um, get into the right mindset, you secure the right talent. Mm. And um, what would you say is, uh, is unique about the customer journey that, that you work with the, with your clientele? Um, perhaps what is different for folks that are listening that might be different to the industries that they're in? So, 
I mean, the customer journey for us, right, is you know, they, they reach out to us saying, I need theoretically 10 electricians next week, right? And so for us, it's, okay, great, but we have to always dig deeper. It's like, tell us more about what they're going to be doing exactly so we get the right person. So there's a, there's a very proactive effort being made to make sure that we really understand the need of the customer. And at the same token, right, make sure we really understand the skills of the talent that we work with. So some we've worked with for many, many years. So they, they use us and, and we place them regularly. Mm -hmm. so, so we know what they've worked on and where they've made customers happy and they've had successful outcomes. Uh, whereas if someone knew, we really have to get really, really strong. So one thing we do, I think, better in, in, uh, in our industry, I think a differentiator is that we really test our people. Like we actually will bring them in the office rather than physically do, you know, go through an electrical board in particular and bend pipes and uh, test their skills to make sure that we're taking, um, you know, a, a very calculated risk relative to putting those people on the jobs of the customer because there's a big, you know, level of trust. The other component is a huge focus on safety. Uh, you know, you can see all that safety, SPQ, safety, productivity, and quality. Those are our kind of, you know, anchors that we have to make sure we cover on. And, and it's not like a, you know, a, a paperclip somewhere, like a, something that we keep somewhere chachi. It's, this is really every day we talk about it. I mean, this is at the heart of everything we, we do. Everything else after that is, is, a, is a consequence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, something that we were kind of talking about, um, appreciate that I'm, I'm hearing coming up a lot, is all about... Um, finding the the right person for the right place and making it the the, the right fit. So can you perhaps um, elaborate a little bit more on that point? And I guess within the context of your team as well, in terms of how you uh, kind of carry that ethos forwards of fitting the right people into the right roles. Yeah, so it's understanding the responsibility we take, right? And so when we engage with a customer, we basically say, we promise we're going to find the right person for you, right? So being clear that that's what that means. It's not just like, you know, it's like there's a, there's a moral obligation that goes along with that. So first, if that's not understood and felt, right, we'll probably need to have a different conversation. It's not checkmark work, which also means we're going to ask the questions to the customer to be as specific as possible as to the needs. Then we have to be really tactical, right, in either searching our database of people we already know in our system, we, we have, you know, hundreds of thousands of records in our database of searching them tactically with the right keywords or things like that, or we just know them so that we can best match the person to the job. But if we don't have enough of the right people in our database or enough of the right people available right now, then if we go in the marketplace and we create a job posting, how do we carefully craft the position that we publish to trigger the right person to apply, but also trigger the wrong person from not applying. You know, like we wanna, it's, it's equally important to us to avoid the wrong candidates coming in than having the right candidates coming in because otherwise it's, it's also work we have to think about and sifting through that information, we want that information to be as clean as possible. So there's a real tactical mindset uh, that has to come together relative to how we gather information, which I think is true for most industries. Um, when it comes to sales team, a sales team, they go, I get a yes quick enough, but I haven't asked all the right questions. I have not tried to unsell the deal, for example. I think that's a mistake. You should. You should really look at, are you really the right customer? I think, you know, the, the you know, ideal customer profile mindset should be really at the heart of where the conversation starts. Because we began the more obligation of saying, yeah, we can find the right person or sometimes say, we don't think we're the right team for you. Yeah. And I think that's, um, it's, it's a point that I'm hearing a lot more, you know, even in other industries around, um, rather than taking the approach of that hard sell and we're going to make this square peg fit into the round hole as, as best we can. Instead, it's taking on more of a role of almost an advisor, right? Um, where you are listening to the, to the to the needs and and the, and the pains of what your customer has, and then being able to demonstrate your expertise, I guess, in the market to then be able to make a recommendation that 
may well be someone that you have internally, but also may be uh, an alternative as well that perhaps isn't your business. Right. That's exactly right. That's, 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 that's becoming more and more important. I think businesses understand that just selling to anyone is not a good strategy long term. Yeah. How do you, um, if I were to get a bit more specific, how does that perhaps work in, within your team then in terms of matching up your, um, your ICP together with your sales team to ensure that perhaps they only are talking to a good fit in terms of a customer? Hmm. Um, I mean, it's kind of part of the magic box, right? It's, <laughs> it's, uh, there, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of, and, and I'm not saying to be coy. That's right? why I asked the question. <laughs> is, is, yeah, yeah. The, the, the reality is, you know, oftentimes you will know that on the scoreboard, meaning, you know, how many of the people you send actually stick, right? Actually, you know, the customer says, you know, they're really the right guys. You know, it happens. Sometimes we send someone and after four hours, they're like, that's not a good fit. Like, I want this guy off my job site. Um, or vice versa. You know, the team member goes there. It's like, what they need me to do is not what you said. I'm an electrician and they want me to sweep the floors all morning. That's not what I do. I'm an electrician. I'm not mm. a cleaning mm. lady, right? And so, so there's a, there's a you know, a, a real um, scoreboard that we, we can look at. Um, really, I feel the other part is, you know, proactively engaging in conversation with the customers, proactively engaging in conversation with the team member and asking point blank, do you have the right people? Is this the right fit for you? Do you like it? Um, because, you know, we, we talk a lot about, you know, like silent uh, resignation, right? This whole thing, right? But we also have, you know, silent customers that say, you know, yeah, that's fine. And if you're not actually really listening, you go, oh, great. But in reality, they're like, that's just fine. That's not good enough, right? So again, having the courage to ask the question, hey, I'm hearing you're not necessarily like super happy. I want to make sh- clear on a scale of one to 10, where are you at? If it's less than an eight, you got a problem, right? And so I think as companies, that's really that process-wise, then it's going backwards right into what happened and debrief and go, did we know enough? Did we ask enough of the right questions? Did we document the right way? Did we rush to send a body to the job site versus making sure we send the right body to the job site? And, and where is that balance? Because there is a balance too, right? Some customers will also appreciate the fact that we'll say, hey, we send you this guy, we're 60%. We're not 100% sure he's the right fit for you, but we think there's a good probability. And the customer may say, all right, you know what? I don't, I don't have a better batting average. so." Let's, let's, you know, let's give it a shot. So, I mean, I think there's an important element of humility uh, that has to permeate through this process. And if you're overly confident, you know, again, that turns into like the car salesman mentality. This is the best deal ever. Like, let's not play that game mm-hmm. anymore. How do you, uh, uh, how do you call that out? Um, uh, the, I guess for like behind the scenes, how do you call out when, it's like a, you know, happy years. Yeah, like everything's going fine. This is definitely going to come in. Um, do you have like a process in mind to, to spot that early? Or is it something that you're having to do retrospectively? So, I mean, obviously we have certain metrics that we look at, right? And in, in the metrics, there's a variety of metrics around, you know, retention, average hours worked per week. Um, those are big things like fail rates, you know, mm-hmm. They said I need 10 people, but we've deployed five. Um, also the churn, you know, how many people do we send? Like if we say we send 25 people to fill 10 spots, you know, maybe the class is going to go, wow, you guys are not doing really well at finding me the right people. So there's quite a few, you know, metrics that we are able to look at to understand how well are we doing? Like I often look at the total number of placements under a position relative to the number of open seats. And if there's a huge delta here, then I'm going to dig deeper to understand, like, did we really ask the right question to the customer? Did we really understand? Or is it a recruiting issue? Like, does the recruiting team not do a good job at digging into the data to make sure we're putting the right people out there? So, but it's going to be one of the two. 
it's like, and that's the part that's always great. I think about, you know, good revenue management strategies is to get to what are the two questions I need to know that I really need to know. And, and, and when you break it down, it does come down to usually one, two, three, and that's about it. Like, it's not that many, but you really have to know them. What would you say those two or three are for, for, for you? Well, for us, right? Like, did we really understand the customer's need? And on the other side is, did we really understand the team member's skills? Right. If, and if we know that, then there is no excuse why we couldn't find the right Yeah. yeah. Um, to, I guess to, to, to pull us out of that, and I'm, I'm interested to take us down a, maybe a slightly different route, but for, um, for your team as a whole, um, what would you say um, differentiates your, kind of your, your top performers? And I'm, I'm guessing it probably comes back to those two questions that you've mentioned there um, and the rest of the pack. It's those two questions. Lit, lit yeah, I mean, yeah. You said it. And that's, and that's the, like, I would challenge someone to argue there's another element. The reality is the top performers understand what the customers really want. And they really understand the skills of the team members they have. I, you know, now you can add color to this. By understanding what the customers really want, they pick the right customers, right? So for example, if someone says, you know, I need a bunch of, plumbers, right? And you're in a marketplace where you know that the labor market is extremely constrained on plumbers. You're going to have to be really cautious about how much energy you're going to invest in securing plumbers for that person, unless this customer may say, I understand this market is very constrained. And so I'm okay paying a little bit more. And so that, that's, that's our obligation to really actually go if you want us to put the effort, we do need to have a fighting chance to succeed for you as well. So, you know, in a, in a way, like we have to have this transparency and this humility going, if you want this, that's, that's what it's going to take. And by the way, sometimes we have to say, this is really going to be tough. Like, you know, we, we're not super comfortable with this. We'll take it, but managing expectations. And if you manage expectations, be hyper communicative. You know, like, I don't believe in good communication in those cases. I believe in hyper communication, like really almost daily say, listen, this normally when we post an application, a job, we'll get 50 applications per day. This one, we're getting five. So this is, the market is telling us something. And, 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 and here is what we posted. Here's what it says. So Mr. Customer, does it feel right to you? It feels right to me. Okay. So what are the things we can tweak? And usually it's pay. That's just bottom yeah. line. Yeah. Uh, what I, what I suppose is is standing out to me, and what so much of it comes down to um, for, for for QLM in particular, is that that discovery stage, both with the with the with the customer, and also with the um, uh, the, the prospective person that you're looking to place into that into that company. So, what would you say then? And and I'm coming at this from a SaaS perspective, I guess. Um, what would you say are the best practices then in terms of the questions that you encourage your teams to ask when they are doing that discovery stage, either with a customer or with a um, prospective candidate? Yeah, so there's a question I love, and, and it may seem totally coming out of left field, but it's asking, like, what do you want? Yeah. Uh, I think it's true in our business every day, um, but I think it's true for the customer. Like, what do you really want from these people? And now they'll start maybe opening up to, the style of employee they want, right? And, and so you can kind of get a sense of that. So that's, I think that's an important question you can always ask. You know, asking a team member, what do you want? Like, you know, I want to be able to work within, you know, 45 minutes of my house. Maybe that's a critical aspect for them. So now it helps you, okay, these opportunities outside of that realm, I'm not even going to bother you with those, right? Um, and, and if what they want is not aligned with reality, then sometimes, be straight up and go, sorry, you know, this is not going to fly. So that's, I think that's a question outside of this, what I would consider the standard skills question, right? Like the skill sets is a pretty mechanical thing. They need to know this. They need to know how to do this. They need to have experience having done that. <clears throat> Those are pretty zeros and ones, right? And, and, and building that questionnaire in your mind, 
and through experience. I mean, most of our people have done this for many, 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 many years. Um, another part that I would add to this is also making sure the communication between the sales team and the team that's going to place people on the jobs has to be impeccable. Um, so, so it's not just asking the right question, but it's also documenting that information. So using good systems, right? So that you don't have to spend hours talking about it. The person should be able to view what you're asking for and understand, oh, I know exactly what they're looking for. I understand. And, and I think that's true in any business, by the way, like documenting the information you gather. Also, over time, you can go back to the customer and say, this is what you said. Is it still true? Not, it's not used to be like, oh, you changed your mind. Like, that's not the point. It's like, hey, is this still true? And, and, and that question creates a lot of value in terms of, oh, wow, they're actually paying attention. They're documenting my stuff. They're repeating what I said. I probably want those people, these people on my team. Right? So we're big on you know, recurring revenue, effectively, right? Like you know, in SaaS, obviously, recurring revenue is more like you know, renewal. Well, for us, they renew every yeah. day. Yeah. Um, I love the... Uh... <laughs> I, I love the simplicity of it in a way. Um, and I'm quite curious to know then um, for how do you go about for those that perhaps are struggling to ask the, the right questions? And, you know, when, when we have this conversation right now, it's like, well, it sounds pretty simple, right? Um, there's a lot of wow. um, there's a lot of matching up the, the, the job description to the customer, uh, probably a lot of imagining kind of closed questions at that point and the beauty of a question like what do you want is it's quite open and it really starts right. to, to 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 turn the page on it so how do you go about you know for for, for those that perhaps they aren't um hitting their number as much how do you go about training them on asking better questions you use the word simple and i'm a huge fan of simple uh one of the things i've used many many times and i found it to be pretty effective i asked them if you were talking to your best friend, I used to say family it didn't work because some people don't like their family. <laughs> uh, so, so if you use, if you talk to your best friend, what would you need to know to make sure you help them the best way you can? And if you're not willing to speak at that level, you're probably not going to do right by the customer or the team member. So, I think the best friend analogy most people can really relate to it. Like a best friend, as you know, doesn't tell you just what you want to hear. The best friend will tell you what you need to hear. Will ask you the questions you need to answer, right? Like if a best friend is acting in a way that's inconsistent with what you think is good for them, as their best friend, you should call them out and go, hey, buddy, like, you're drinking too much or you're, you're being a jerk or whatever, but that's what a friend does. So, so that's kind of the mindset that we've, we've tried to emulate for, for or, or staffs in the company to say, just Deal with them and tell them, say, you know, if you were my best friend, I would ask you this. Nice. I, I, I quite like the example. I think that the one that I normally go for is uh, try to explain it uh, as in, you know, if we were marketing it, for example, and, and doing like maybe ad copies, it's the same in, the, in, a, in a sales world. I tend to put it in a, imagine that you're talking to someone at a wedding that you've never met before. And usually the response I get back is, why are you talking to someone at a wedding about what your software company does? <laughs> right. But it's a nice way of thinking about it, right? Because it forces you to do it in a way of, well, now I need to really simplify it down and take out all of the technical language and put it in a way that, and, and think about it in a way that is like, how do I align these two together and communicate this in a way that's going to make sense? And, and I agree with that. So I guess we're talking about two almost components of that conversation. One of them is, what do you ask? And what you're talking about is, how do you ask? How do you speak to it? So it's, one is, is like the content and one is the form factor and the language used. I, I completely agree with that. Um, when people get too uh, cute with the wording and stuff, it's, it's a turn off. I mean, you, we, we all know that. Like, we all have been at that conversation with the, it's like, you're a try hard. This is, this is like, we, yeah, it's the uh, I, I overheard someone in, having that conversation in a, in a coffee shop the other week and uh, the chap was like, yeah, try it again. Why are you calling me? And it was like, yeah, I just I just really don't understand what what, what we're talking about here. I'm just I'm just going to put the phone down. It's like ah, and, and it's gone. 
Right. Um, Frederick, let me ask you um, a slightly different question. What is the initiative that you're most proud of from 2023? At QLM? At QLM. Uh, it's the same as 2022. And it's the one that made me join the company. It's our philanthropic work. Okay. Um, Mark, who is the, the founder of the company, um, and I met through nonprofit work. And, uh, you know, it's easy, like you ask for a company, right? You know, why do you want to grow? If you don't have any shareholder, like we're, you know, we have, we're a privately held company. Is it because you just want to make more money? Um, sometimes they go, well, because I want to help more people, you know, okay, great. That's fine. For us, it's really, we want to help more people in three different ways. We have multiple clients as we call them. Like we have our team members, we have our customers, we have our staff, we have our community and those less fortunate. So we have five clients that we speak of. Um, the fifth one is the biggest driver is we want to grow and be profitable so we can give more into you know, philanthropic work. And so last year we, and the year before, we gave money to every branch with multiple locations and we challenged them to find a nonprofit organization that they would help. And when we do our annual meeting, actually a good portion of our annual meeting is actually the branches reporting on the work they did in nonprofit. And, and I'm, I love that we do that as a company and that's really an, an anchor of who we are as a business. Brilliant. And it's, it's actually really refreshing to hear, actually. Um, so, so often I think when I ask the question, it's like, well, we, we ran this campaign and it, and, it, and it had this impact for the business, but actually it's the, you know, going over and above and the role of the, the, the business in the, in the community, right? And, and the role that it plays and, and the mission as a whole, which uh, I think is admirable. Well, it goes back to what do you yeah. want? Yeah. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Bottom line. It's just, I, I love your view of the world. It's just so beautifully simple. <laughs> I, maybe I'm naive, right? And, uh, but, you know, uh, I'm, I'm very comfortable with my naivety. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I respect it. Um, let me ask you one final question, Frederick. Um, what is one book that you'd recommend to revenue leaders and why? So there's this one book that, and there's why I recommend it because it's triggered a lot of thoughts for me. Uh, it's, it's a book by uh, um, Jason Jennings. It's not the big that it's the small, it's the fast that it's the slow. It's a really long title. <laughs> but it goes against uh, the simple ethos here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, it, it's got, like the book has a lot of like very simple principles around successful businesses and what they've done. Uh, I, I wouldn't say I'm a voracious reader, but I'm a voracious listener. So I'm a big on audibles and like on my commute, I'll, I'll listen to books. Um, the other one I really like, it's, it, it's not what you say, it's what you do by Lawrence Otten. And, and Lawrence and, and Jason are work together. Jason passed away uh, a, a few years back. Uh, and, and I know Lawrence personally and, and you know, the, the kind of mindsets they have, I think are really aligned with what resonates with me. Um, you know, they're, they're very driven by the mindset of revenue is a consequence. I would almost call it, it's an inevitable consequence. Uh, and, and, and so people go, when I hear good, go, go to a meeting and they say, well, we need to hit this number. And in my mind, I always chuckle about that. I was like, okay, great. That means absolutely nothing to anybody because that's just a scoreboard. The question is, you know. How much do you need to do along the way to get there? And if as a company, you have not understood that, then don't say that last part. It's kind of like starting a soccer game and say, we need to win. No, -uh. really? Like you're not getting on the field if you don't want to win. That's just the bottom line. But then are you running in the right direction? It's not how many miles do you run, but are you taking the right place? Are you making the right moves? And I think as businesses, this is where we're trying to oversimplify. We're trying to just say, just sell more. No, it doesn't work. That's not how the world works. You know, really at that point, this is where you have to, you have to dig in and understand 
what are all the different levers? Like I think about like a big music mixer that you have to play with to understand how, how is it sounding right now? And then little, little by little, say, now do people like the sound? And, and then you can see what's happening. So that's kind of how I think about it. I, um, I, so. I, I really like it. And uh, I, I lied. I'm going to ask a follow-up question because I'm, I'm curious. Um, how do, how do, if, let, let's say you, you go into one of your meetings and it's like, Frederick, you know, we've got this revenue target. And as you say, you, you chuckle a little bit. But how do, you, how do you then take that and go away and then break that down into, okay, what are my what my input's going to be. How, how am I going to ensure that we hit this number? To, to, to your point, and I guess this is the example in the book, what am I going to do or what's my team going to do that's going to allow us to hit that number? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm simply going to ask questions. I want to ask questions like, well, tell me what are the factors that are going to influence that number? And, and so they'll say activities. Great. What about the activities? Right. And then, and then they'll say this, and then sometimes I'll start steering the question and go, okay, so how important do you think having spent time defining your ideal customer profile is going to be in, the, in, in that? Well, that's really, really important. Okay, great, cool. So we're adding that to this. And, now, and then also they'll start, people will see the picture. It's like, hey, listen, there's, there's this thing I, I say often in business is there is not a single thing that will make you successful, but any single thing can make you fail. Mm. So doing one thing right is not enough. And doing one thing wrong could kill you. And if you're not straight about that in your mind, you know, then you're going to have a problem. So a lot of people, pe people drive, try to drive right behavior. I tend to work on trying to focus on the wrong ones and correct them to increase the average. So I'm real bottom up kind of guy. I was like, let's look at what's not working, fix that and elevate the floor. Mm -hmm. Because that's what we're going to fall through. Mm. Do you? Um, I I really like that approach, and actually, that kind of um, kind of runs contrary to certainly a number of folks that I've spoken to, which often take the approach of, well, I'm going to focus in and make sure that my high performers are, you know, they're crushing it this month, and almost to the point where, you know, I think from from analysis that we do, some seventy three percent had missed their quota. And so for a lot of leaders, they're really focusing and dialing into what their top performers are doing to really push those, to really carry the others along. But I actually really like your approach of, you know, for those folks that are doing well, you know, I guess you're in a, you kind of mentioned earlier that they've been with the business for a number of years. I suppose they're in a position where um, context is important, where I'm guessing that they're reliable and you can trust them to consistently hit their number. And actually then that allows you to really dial in on those um, who are just a, a little bit over the uh, surface line uh, to really help them. Right. Is that a fair assumption? Yeah. No, no, and that's, and that's right. I mean, it, it's, um, so we, we spend more of our awake time at work. You know, we might as well do stuff we're proud of. Um, you know, um, and, and as, as, I think as executives, our, our obligation is to ensure that we help people be successful. Right. It doesn't mean at any cost, just to be clear. Like, it's not like, you know, I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm a huge believer in nonprofit. Uh, I'm still a capitalist, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to keep the wrong person. And, but sometimes it's also understanding why they're not taking the right actions. Is it because the seed they're in is not the right seed for them? And maybe they don't even know it. Again, it goes back to what do you want? Right. And, and anything you want, you know, you're going to take actions that align with that. I mean, everything we do is driven by two emotions, pain and pleasure. That's it. If the pleasure wins over the pain, either short-term or long-term, right? That's what you're going to do. That's just the bottom line. And so I think you have to be really good at the human interaction and, and also getting people to feel comfortable. They're not going to be judged. It's, we have an obligation, again, to the team member, to our clients, to have the right people the right seats. And, and so it goes back to this mindset perspective of it's a more obligation we have as a, as an organization. Yeah, I com completely agree. And, and that's probably a nice place to, to put a bow on this. Um, 
Frederick, it's been a real pleasure to to chat and and hear about your world and particularly the uh, uh, the nonprofit work that you guys are doing as well. Um, for anyone listening, if they uh, if they wanted to connect or perhaps reach out with any questions, where can they find you? Um, they can find me an email at QRM. It's uh, f eton at myqrm dot com. Um, so I'm pretty easy to find. You can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I try to respond on LinkedIn. I'm getting bombarded a little bit lately, so it's not been great at keeping up with that. Um, but I, I do try to, you know, be really focused on not having any unread emails. That's something I can't. Gives me the stresses me out. Nice. <laughs> well, for any uh, if it, there happen to be any SDRs listening to it, that now you know how to reach uh, reach Frederick because uh, it, it's through his inbox, not through his LinkedIn. Um, all right, I'll. Uh, I'll make sure to put put links to those down in the show notes, as well as the uh, a couple of the books that you uh, that you mentioned earlier. Um, but yeah, thank you so much again for for joining me and to everyone that's listened to the episode this week. Thank you so much. We'll catch you next week. Thank you.